Thank you, Alan. I have been involved in the global warming war since for about 30 years, which means I do remember the last ice age, and, uh, and <coughs> I'm too old to carbon date. So uh, in the process of prosecuting the war, uh, one of the things I was searching for was how could this possibly happen? Is it unique to climate science? Uh, because, you know, climate scientists are no more meretricious than the other scientists, and they're interested in their own self-interest as well as finding the truth as long as the truth doesn't harm them very much. And so I have sort of generalized um, from the climate area, and I'm going to be talking about the whole concept of science and the regulatory state. And of course, the leitmotif for my talk is going to be climate change, because that's my area of expertise. So why should we care whether science is trustworthy? Well, number one, the regulatory state, and you can't say we don't live in one of those, claims that it's regulations are based in, quote, science, you know. Uh, in fact, I, I think of animal farms. Scientists say pigs need milk and apples. I myself do not like them, but we must have them in order for us to prosecute our work. Um, so the regulatory agencies rely on summary science, and I'll show you what I mean by summary science. So if the science is increasingly unreliable, then the summaries of science are increasingly unreliable, and the policies that we uh, undertake are based upon increasingly biased or incomplete science. Okay, hey, want an example? Here's an example of a summary of science. It's the latest report from the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, it's, uh, it's bad. <laughs> this report ignores uh, the fact that it hasn't warmed for now 18 years, kind of just sweeps that under the so-called rug. It uh, um, predicts warming that is simply not supported by the climate models. And as I get to the end of this talk, I'm going to show you one graphic, one simple graphic that is going to destroy this report in one fell swoop. It's that easy. However, what did it do? It surveyed a very broad literature. It surveyed uh, uh, climate science, and it came up with the usual. This report is no different than the previous ones, which are no different than the previous ones. We are all going to die unless we ship tremendous amounts of money from the producer nations to the non-producer nations. No problem. Now, in the United States, we have similar summary reports. This is what was the basis for our Environmental Protection Agency's uh, endangerment finding from carbon dioxide. The Supreme Court ruled in 2007 that if the EPA found that carbon dioxide in endangered human health and welfare, that it must regulate it, presumably to the point of non-endangerment. Uh, and you, we will see that this will play a very important role, this endangerment finding and the court case that was the basis for it uh, in our, our little search for the problems that are going on in science today. So what are, some, what are some of the problems? One of them is called publication bias. And this is a, it's been defined many times. Here's one of my favorite definitions. Uh, from H. H. Dubbin in the British Medical Journal in 2005, publication bias is a well-known phenomenon in which public positive results have better chance of being published, are published earlier, and are published in journals with higher impact factors. Negative not results need not apply. It doesn't matter, you know, that fish oils actually really don't extend your life that that report takes 20 years to appear. People take things which, in fact, are associated with a 40 percent increase in prostate cancer in males. That would be fish oils and not just nice prostate cancers, the kinds that are very aggressive. So anyway, what's going on? It's not just climate science. Ah, here's Randy Sheckman, uh, 2013 Nobel Prize winner in physiology or medicine. That's not a typo. That's the name of the prize that is given. And the day before he gets the prize, he writes an op-ed in, of all places, the London Guardian. And the title, and what, what his uh, op-ed is, is how journals like Nature, Cell, and Science are damaging science. Wow. So what did Sheckman say in this op-ed? This guy is about to receive the Nobel Prize. He says he's not going to send any more, any more papers to these journals. He's going to withhold his papers from these journals because they are covering what he calls flashy science. They are selectively printing articles 
that generate headlines and increase the so-called impact factors of the journal. That creates problems in science. That's how we get things like IPCC reports. It's because of the incentives that are involved in the system. Like I said, scientists are not special human beings. They're not people in white lab coats who have more virtue than other people. Uh, they respond to incentives, and one of them is publication in Nature or Science virtually, whoops, whoa, sorry, virtually guarantees academic tenure. That's a job for life, by the way. Tenure ain't what it's cracked up to be, folks, okay? Tenure is like a 30-member group marriage, forced, unless you want to get out, and it's really hard to get out. And you know how that works. I mean, the problem is if you say something in a relationship that's going to last 30 years and didn't go down real well, it's likely to uh, affect the relationship for the next 30 years. So it doesn't promote freedom of speech. It does not promote diversity of speech. It promotes unity of speech and lack of confrontation because who wants to be yelled at by 29 other people for 30 years? More importantly than that, more important than the tenure aspect, it will keep you out of what we, in America we call coach. That's the back section of the plane. Academics will do anything in their power to stay out of coach, and by the way, so will I. Uh, <laughs> scientists will therefore gravitate toward research topics that will be published in Science and Nature magazine. So they're going to gravitate towards writing the paper, global warming is going to kill billions. And they are not going to gravitate toward writing the paper that global warming is probably going to extend our, extend our lives and might actually be a little bit of fun or something like that. <laughs> so when I first was going after this talk, um, the first version of this was 18 minutes. That's much more merciful than this one, unfortunately. Uh, and I went through the scientific literature of the moment, or, or the news stories of the moment when I was preparing the talk. First, the first time, and this was in late January of this year, and sure enough, I found just the most wonderful example of flashy bias coming out of Nature magazine the very day I was working on this talk. Uh, Apocalypse Now, unstoppable man-made climate change will become reality by the end of the decade. He gad! That's only six years from now, and could make New York, London, and Paris uninhabitable within 45 years, claims new study. Way to go. And where did this study appear? In Nature magazine. Indeed, I'm reading from the, uh, reading from the newspaper article. Indeed, the study from the University of Hawaii published online yesterday in the journal Nature predicts that even if we utilize all resources to stop and halt our current carbon emissions, the changes are irrevo irrevocable and can only be postponed. All things remain the same. New York will begin to experience dramatic life-altering temperatures. Read the headline, New York, London, and Paris uninhabitable within 45 years. Well, even looking at the most lurid climate model that I can find, summer temperatures in the northern, northern mid-Atlantic region, i.e. New York City, might go up about 6 degrees Celsius by the year 2100. 45 years from now, oh, maybe, might, it might be 4 or something like that. But let's just say they go up 8 degrees Celsius in the summer, because that means what we've done is we have changed the climate of New York to the climate of Miami, doing the New Yorkers the favor of keeping them from having to move to Miami by the time they get to be 60 years old. Gee, what a tragedy that is. <clears throat> of course, uh, you, can, you can apply it in Australia, too. It's about the difference between moving from here to somewhere between Sydney and, and, and uh, Brisbane. Yeah, I'm sure that it's going to kill us all. And it's, by the way, it's well known in the United States that the further south you live, the, less lo the sooner you die. And in Australia, the further north you live, of course, the sooner you die, too. Everybody knows this. Now, this is all very well and good. My colleagues don't believe climate science, that they are subject to this incentive system. Honest to God, it's true. Uh, and, and it comes from uh, a statement made by some of the most funded climate scientists uh, in my business in response to this court case that I brought up, Mass v. EPA in front of the Supreme Court. They called themselves the climate scientists. And that's how Al Gore would say it. Climate scientists say we're all going to die. Uh, but what they really wrote was, outcomes may turn out better than our best current predictions, but it's just as possible that environmental and health damages will be more severe than the best predictions. Now, the difference between me and my so-called friends, uh, and I, I choose my words carefully, 
is that I don't treat statements like this as facts. It's not a statement of fact. It's a testable hypothesis. So why don't we test it and see if it's true? All right. Now here's what they're saying is, is, is what the literature reflects. Each one of these pieces of colored spaghetti on this, this graph, this is from the 2007 IPCC report, is about $500 million worth of taxpayer money on some climate modeling program for agency XYZ or ABC or NASA or EPA. And one of the things you notice is, if, is the black dotted line in the middle. That's the average warmings predicted by all these models. By the way, this isn't right, OK? This have a, has a life expectancy of about 22 more minutes. Remember that. Uh, but you can see that each one of these lines, each one of these models, uh, it actually has an equal probability of being either below, above or below that mean. So. Theoretically, the climate literature should therefore have about the same number of papers that say it's going to be hotter than we thought it was, or it's not going to be as hot as we thought it was, or it's going to cause worse things than we thought, or it's going to cause not as bad things as we got. Ha! Just consult the Daily Mail if you believe that. So what I did was I took a look at 13 months of science in Nature magazine, took every article that I could find on climate change or the impacts of climate change and threw them into one of three piles. Either it's not as bad as we thought, better, it's worse than we thought, or it's neutral and I can't classify this. I couldn't figure it out from looking at the article. Now the prediction from the climate scientists is that there should be an equal probability of finding an article that it's worse than we thought or it's not as bad as we thought. How many people believe that silly notion? Well, I mean, you know, I am not very much of a sportsman. I have a hard time tiring of shooting these very big fish in this very small barrel. And so here are the results. Uh, there were 115 articles on climate change or its impact. 23, I couldn't tell, were neutral. Eight were not, nine were not as bad as we thought, and 83 were worse than we thought. Now, does anybody have an, an idea how many times you have to flip a coin 92 times to have a 50% chance of coming up with nine or fewer heads or tails? Okay, well, it's a real big number. It's the one at the bottom of this. Uh, bottom. Well, oh, that's not enough. You only looked at science and nature for 13 lousy months, Michael. Okay, so let's look at them for several years. And in fact, let's take a look at more than science and nature. Let's take a look at nature climate change. Like, sure, nature climate change is going to publish. You know, the reason that we're publishing this journal is because the problem isn't a problem. I'm sure they're going to do that. Uh, oh, I forgot to tell you, this actually got published. No one read it, but it got published. Uh, but uh, so then I, I took uh, a, a larger selection of science, nature, nature climate change, and aggregated them. I'm going to publish this, by the way. Uh, in a September fest shift for S. Fred Singer, who will turn 90 years old in September. And um, the only thing, I, I'll tell you how much I like Fred. First of all, he was my colleague at University of Virginia, where I was for 30 years, by the way. And when they found out the way I thought, the faculty there gave me a nickname. It was Little Fred. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so uh, here are the probabilities, uh, looking at them kind of the reverse way, uh, that in fact this literature is non-biased. In Science Magazine it's 10 to the minus 13. Uh, we aggregate them all up, all these three journals, and it is, yes, 10 to the minus 46. Now, I don't know if you know how big 10 to the minus 46 is, or 10 to the 46th power if you want to inverse it, but there are not 10 to the 46th stars in the universe. <laughs> Just thought I'd point this out. OK, so how does this happen? Does anybody want to play the public choice game today? Let's see. You are unfortunately sitting a little bit out in the aisle, so you are now the administrator of NASA. OK? And I am junior senator from Tennessee, and it's the early 1990s. What's your name? Uh, Malcolm. Malcolm. Malcolm yeah. whom? Uh, oldest. Oldest? Yeah. Dr. Oldis, Dr. Oldis, I am the junior senator from Tennessee. And scientists have told me, you, by the way, are the senior administrator for NASA. You're the administrator for NASA. Could NASA effectively use $3 billion more a year to study this problem of climate change? Is it that as important? What do you say? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, because you see, the guys in back of you, 
the four are, are your, your agency subheads. And unlike people who carry combs or passports in their pockets in Washington, D.C., they carry knives. And if you said no, that knife was going right through you. So <clears throat> you turn to your four buddies after you've uh, said yes, and you say, hey, guys, I just got us $3 billion a year. Uh, can, can you all get me program proposals within the next two months as to how we're going to spend this $3 billion? You know, you, 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 and you are the four agency subheads. Are any one of you going to send in a proposal that says, well, I think this is an overblown issue and maybe we should, you know, save our money or send it to some other organization with which we are competing? Well, then the knives are going to come out from the guys in the row and back of you because they're your worker bee scientists and you've had it. And which one of you worker bee scientists are going to submit the proposal to your boss that says that this is an overblown problem and maybe we shouldn't do anything about it? That's if you want a job elsewhere. Okay, not going to happen. Oh my God, and then you do your research and you send it off to Nature Magazine and who reviews your paper? Him! The guy over there who got the other part of the money. And your paper says this is a terrible problem and climate change is going to kill three billion people, and he says, oh, this paper has very few flaws. Uh, they forgot to capitalize the word uh, um, whatever has to be capitalized, otherwise accept it, uh, and it's published. Unfortunately, you, you're kind of probably an Aspie like me, and you send in a paper that says, well, you know, I think it's an overblown issue, and guess who reviews that one? Him. And he says, oh my god, this paper is so flawed, we can't publish this thing, we just can't do it. Well, the times they are changing. Judith Curry, by the way, from Georgia Tech is here in Melbourne, and I guess she couldn't come down, but she's going to be here soon. She's one of the big scientists in this area, and she tells me that the bomb that I'm going to show you at the end of this talk uh, is very probably going to be accepted if I send it in now. 18 years is just too much of an over overburden for the truth to suffer. So, anyway. Ah, but it's not just climate science. Here is the next up-and-coming person that you have never heard of. His name is Daniele Finelli. He is from the University of Montreal. He did a lot of his work at Edinburgh. He just moved there. Uh, he obviously can get away with what I can't because, like Bjorn Lomborg, he's um, a recognized, you know, card-carrying lefty. And so he can get away with this. He got the equivalent of a MacArthur Fellowship uh, in Europe. These are genius awards and things like that recently. Uh, and he published a paper in 2012 with the astounding conclusion that negative results are disappear disappearing from most disciplines and countries. And in fact, this is really very impressive stuff. I'll show you this graphic here. Um, this is the percent of positive results. <laughs> Look at this is between, between 1990 and 91 and 2007. So I test a hypothesis and I, it's supported at the 0.05 level. I don't, I'm not compelled to reject it. Well, <laughs> wait till the end of this talk and we'll talk about what you're compelled to reject. Um, but this can't be true. We can't be getting smarter like that, and only testing hypotheses, I mean, being so good with our hypotheses. What we're doing is we're testing things that we know will give us a positive result because you got us the money from Mr. Gore. Thank you very much. Now, the implication of this is staggering because what it must mean is the number of false positives is going up at a prodigious rate. Remember that the metric that we use in science is generally the 0.05 probability level. And so 5% of a much bigger number of positive results is 5% plus X more false positives. That's why we're seeing the epidemic of rejections, even I mean, the epidemic of, of retractions of scientific papers. It's because of the incentive system in science. And thank you very much for our funding structure and for our flashy journals for helping us do this. Now, for the next few minutes, I'd like to answer the question, how in the world we got here? Well, everybody on the liberal, meaning the Australian liberal side of the fence, knows that in America we had somebody who really, really liked government and really, really liked children to be dependent upon government, meaning the people of his country. Here is our father, Franklin Roosevelt, and all the dependent children doing Ring Around the Rosie with Mr. Roosevelt in a political cartoon from the 1930s. Well, Mr. Roosevelt was also really interested in taking over science because we had a problem. We had World War II, and uh, 
Um, um, Einstein signed a letter written by Leo Lazard to the president that says, well, we can conceive of a weapon that conceive of considerably, conceivably mass destructive power per end and BTW, the Germans are working on it too, we think. And so Mr. Roosevelt started the Manhattan Project, uh, which was an explosive success. And then, now we can debate the morality of dropping the bomb on Hiroshima, and I think that's a very, very legitimate debate. But having said that, Mr. Roosevelt knew, he was told, it's going to work probably. And Mr. Roosevelt at the end of the war said, my God, we need to keep these scientists employed. So he wrote to Vannevar Bush, who was the head of the Office of Special Programs. The Manhattan Project was under the Office of Special Programs. I'm not going to read you the letter. But basically it said, you know, look what we did with all these scientists. New frontiers of the mind are before us. And if they are pioneered with the same vision, boldness, and drive which we have, with which we have waged this war, we can create a fuller and more fruitful employment and a fuller and more fruitful life. Welcome to big government and the Manhattan Project. And so two months after, after Vannevar Bush got this letter, he had a report out already. It was called Science, the Endless Frontier. And Science, the Endless Frontier, laid the template for the nationalization of science in the United States. And we'll talk, we can talk a bit about Australia, too. But the idea was not that the government would directly employ the scientists. Oh, no, it was much cleverer than that. It was that the scientists would re write research proposals through their academic institutions, through their universities. And the universities would pull off 50% quote, overhead, end quote, and spend that on the departments that couldn't afford to run themselves. That's the root of political correctness in the academy. The academy is, was, was, um, became a welfare client of Washington, D.C. as a result of the federalization of science. When you're up for promotion and or tenure at a university, I hate to tell you, it is that craven. How much federal money did you bring in? The question is asked. And was it private money? Oh, that's not as good as federal money, even though they're the same dollars. Yes, it's how much you helped the welfare culture within the university. And don't you think the people in the Germanic languages department really think big government is a great thing? You can see how this happened. So, oh, by the way, there were critics at the time. Uh, when Science the Endless Frontier was written, one wag wrote, this really should have been called Science the Endless Budget. So, <laughs> So that gave rise to a beer after, after this, uh, this amiable discussion. For anyone who can identify where this image comes from and what it is, where is it from? One, two, three, four, five. Atlas Shrugged, uh, part one. India. Atlas Shrugged, part one. That is the State Science Institute. I am so lazy, I should have found the building. And so, oh, instead of saying State Science Institute, that said, C. S-I-R-O, because that's the way it is down here. Now, this has certain implications, because now we're going to see how science and policy go hand in hand. Public, we've now made science public good, and that means it's subject to all kinds of public choice influences in the funding business, and that means it has its lobbies. Uh, in 2007, the Senate was debating the, quote, energy bill. This is the Bush II energy bill. And this, this bill had a mandate for the United States to burn up to 50% of its corn. We are the largest producer of corn in the world. And to turn it into ethanol and send it out the tailpipes of cars. Now, we can debate a lot about Hiroshima, but I can tell you morally, taking all that food and sending it out the tailpipe of a car when a lot of people in the world are spending an awful lot of their disposable in income just to keep themselves fed, that's just slightly to the left of immoral. But it is what we do. And therefore, the AAAS did what it must. It served the lobby to pass this bill. I'm driving up 12th Street in the summer of 2007 when this bill is being debated. And I look up at the AAAS building. This is a terrible, crappy image. I can't find a better image of this, so I, I, I ask for your indulgence. But yes, right when the bill was being voted on, a, a banner was unfurled from the building, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. It was a corn cob 
morphing into a gasoline pump and it said fuel for thought and the background in case you can't see is a beautiful blue pristine ocean unpolluted with breaking waves okay I get it if this were the Cuban Academy of Sciences it would say socialismo o muerte we're just doing our job they are the lobby but that's how the incentive system works and it was predicted by this guy this guy was the president of Columbia University and so he saw it happen. Uh, and after Columbia, he had another job that required kind of an exit interview or exit con consultation with the people who employed him. Uh, that would be the farewell address for Dwight Eisenhower in 1961. And it contains a very, very famous statement that all the people on the left love to quote about the military industrial complex. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Well, that's where they stop. Would have been nice if they would have looked at the next two paragraphs. The free university, historically the fountainhead of free ideas and scientific discovery, has experienced a revolution in the conduct of research, partly because of the huge costs involved. A government contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity. Oh my god. Yet holding scientific research and discovery and respect as we should, we must also be aware to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. The prospect of dominations by the nation's scholars, by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever present and is gravely to be regarded. Can anyone say State Science Institute? This is what you get. Remember in Atlas Shrugged, the State Science Institute was instrumental in the downfall of the society because of the way that it rigged the creation of, of uh, scientifically based ideas uh, and the free flow of information in the scientific world. Ah, you know what? People are catching on. They smell a rat. Here's Garth Paltridge. Garth Paltridge um, he, from uh, Hobart, Tasmania. He used to be with CSIRO big guy, retires, wrote this in Quadrant, you probably have all seen this. The average man in the street, a sensible chap who by now can smell the signs of an oversold environmental campaign from miles away, is beginning to suspect that it is politics rather than science, which is driving the issue. Yeah, no kidding, 18 years without warming, that, that, I would begin to suspect that too. And so it has had its consequences, consequences that I need not put names on nor quotations on. For example, Exhibit A, <laughs> Exhibit B. Oh, Exhibit B is a good one. I have a story about him in the question and answer. Somebody will please ask me what happened when I met this man in a restroom in Washington, D.C. Uh, nothing is made up here. And Exhibit C. Now. <clears throat> What's interesting about all this, the next person, you don't know. The next picture, you don't know who this guy is. Well, I'll tell you who he is. He's the estimable Paul C. Chip Knappenberger, who is the senior author on the paper that's in Nature today. Uh, he has been my researcher for 30 years. Uh, he's the brains behind this mouthpiece. He's very, very good. And so I said, Chip, I need these three images of these, these Australian party leaders and prime ministers. And so he gave me a quote on the day that I asked him for this, which was only about 10 days ago. Why do they keep doing this? <laughs> so anyway, uh, now I want to talk about the political consequences in America, and then I'm going to demolish the climate models and then get something to drink. Uh, <clears throat> we had our little cap and trade, or you called yours the, come on, what was it, uh, the emissions trading system. Uh, we had ours, it was a waxman Markey cap-and-trade bill, uh, which would allow 3% below, it was, it was uh, 2005 emissions in 2012, all the way to 82% below 2005 emissions by 2050. Now, to give you an idea what this bill mandated, okay, these are per capita emissions of carbon dioxide in the United States going back to 1800 or so. And you can see here, they begin to take off uh, with uh, the industrialization of North America. So the Waxman-Markey bill merely mandated that the emissions be reduced 
uh, in 2050 per capita to what they were in 1867. <laughs> no problem. Uh, <clears throat> the bill was shepherded through Congress uh, by uh, the president and, and uh, Mr. Waxman, who was a very powerful Democrat. Uh, we did a calculation on how much warming it would save if we went and reduced our emissions 83% immediately and went out to the year 2100. Uh, if we didn't do anything, now this is using the UN's own climate models, which now have about six minutes left to live. Uh, it would be 1.58 degrees Celsius. Uh, if Waxman Markey was done by the US only, it would be 1.54 degrees. And if all the countries had had obligations under the Kyoto Protocol did it, it would be 1.5 degrees. In other words, you couldn't find it. But you would have the per capita emissions of the per capita emissions allowed from an American before electric lights, before cars, before the internet, before life expectancy of 40 years. Yeah, something like that, okay? Well, Garth Poultridge was right. People smelled a rat. Uh, oh, I forgot, how much does this cost? Now, in the United States, we have tax forms. I don't know if you have something like the Paperwork Reduction Act notice or something like that, which has to be on every tax form. This act reduces paperwork or something. They always have uh, uh, to, to make sure they use paper. You'll always find something like this in your tax form. <laughs> this page intentionally left. You think, you think I'm making it up? You, you know, you guys shouldn't be laughing in this talk. You should be crying because it's this bad. All right. So anyway, <clears throat> aha. Now, what were the political costs of cap and trade in the United States? Well, this is something called the Presidential Approval Index. It's published every day uh, by a pollster by the name of Scott Rasmussen. It is the number of people on a three-day running average who strongly approve of the president's performance versus those who strongly disapprove. And the strongly approve line crosses, oh, sorry, the strongly approve line crosses over the strongly disapproved line three days after cap and trade was passed on June 26, 2009, and his approval index was negative for every day after that until right before the 2012 election. Rasmussen also publishes a generic congressional ballot. The week that cap and trade was passed, it switched from, uh, from uh, uh, Democrat to neutral to in this very week of, of June 28th, 09, to red, to Republican, and stayed there until the 2012 election. The result was that the House of Representatives was lost by the Democratic Party, our Labor Party. They lost 63 seats. And if you think it was health care, it was not. Every close race in the House was lost by a Democrat who voted for cap and trade. And in the Senate, every close race was won by a Democrat. They didn't vote for cap and trade. They both voted for health care. So let's see. Malcolm Turnbull, Kevin Rudd, Julia Gillard, the US Office, House of Representatives. It's not so bad, despite the distortion of science. Now I'm going to finish here, or almost finish here, with just a little bit of note. I, talk, I began this, this discussion with about flashy science, and I want to talk about flashy climate science which would mean the large, we're going to publish things about the large impact of greenhouse gas emissions on climate, large negative impacts on the Earth's environment and human society, and it's always worse than we thought. Now, what about those climate models from the United Nations? Uh, here we go. Okay, this is a very busy graph, and I'm going to tr try and work my way through it. You see two gray set, sets of gray lines here. These are the Climb, the, the warming estimates from all 105 models from the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in their latest report. Uh, and what you see, uh, these are the 95% confidence limits and 97.5% confidence limits. This is on the warm side, this is on the cold side, and the black dots are the average warmings predicted by all 105 models for trend lengths beginning at 10 years, meaning 2013, back to 2004, then 11 years, back to 2003, all the way back to 1951. And the colored dots are the observed temperatures. Well, the first thing you notice is that each one of the colored dots, every trend back to 1951, on the average of all, compared to the average of the 105 climate models, is below the warming trend predicted by that average, every last one of them. 
37 years ago, when it's green, it's within the 95% confidence limits. 37 years ago, it drops to yellow, below the 95% confidence limits, and then a few years later, it turns to red. That's at the point 97.5% confidence limit. This is an abject failure of the UN's models. And we'll be putting this in the literature and in the mail very soon. It's been given at three scientific meetings. The biggest substantive criticisms at the American Geophysical Union last summer, and the comment was, uh, I hope you don't show that in public because it might do something that would prevent us from the policies that we need. That's all I need to know when I hear things like that. However, anybody recognize this? Where is this from? On the beach, thank you very much. Where was it taken? Thank you very much. There is still time. There are things that we can do. One of the things that I am doing, oh, if, if, if we knew it was the end of days, uh, and I was in Melbourne at that time, I'd probably be Cary Grant and Lana Turner or something like that. But I would have uh, an alternative, which is to actually try and do something about it. And so I started this thing at Cato called the Center for the Study of Science, where we have um, three new scholars that we've picked up in the last three months. The first is the aforementioned Richard Lindzen. The second one is Edward Calabrese, the man who is going to turn the regulatory paradigm for carcinogens and ionizing radiation on its head. It is based upon science as bad as the global warming science. If you believe that a single photon of ionizing radiation has a chance of giving you cancer, you don't understand that you live in a world of ionizing radiation. Yes, a single photon could decouple one DNA base pair, but you will decouple more and more of them in one day because that's why we all look so old, guys, okay? <laughs> it's Darwin's way of getting us out of the picture. And then we just picked up Terence Keeley. Now, uh, Terence Keeley wrote the book, The Economic Laws of Scientific Research. I owe this center to a person sitting in this audience who planted the idea in my head. That would be Mr. N. Ray Evans right there, who sent me as a gift in the late 1990s Terence Keeley's book, The Economic Laws of Scientific Research. And coming next year, uh, the three of, three of us are publishing a book called High Tech Larceny, How the Government Uses Science to Take Away Your Stuff. Now, I want to close this talk by pointing something out. Um, in climate change, we were winning. We won. People put out crazy policies uh, that the people reject. They rebel against. They throw out the political leaders. They throw out the House of Representatives.